Hello, it's Jeff Tricky here. Um, welcome to this afternoon's webinar. Thank you for joining us. Um, in, in this webinar, we're hoping to deal with um, some practical application of the risk type compass with particular reference to teams, probably for team induction perhaps at the beginning of a project or a team development program if it's a more long established team. I guess some of it may be relevant in some ways to selection but that isn't uh, or selecting a team because some of the considerations about team obviously might come into play as you're recruiting. Um, the the seminar today builds on a previous seminar and I think some of you have attended that but and then the other point is that there are going to be quite a variety of different professionals out there with have different angle on risk and different sort of professional interest in it. Um, so we're trying to steer a path there that's going to be of interest to everybody. Um, so these are our three main objectives for the webinar. We want to reaffirm just a small number of key points about risk types. Some of the fundamentals just to position that. If you want to learn more about risk type, then you probably need another um, one of our webinars or to join one of our uh, workshops in person. Um, the second aim is to discuss some of the preliminary issues, the sort of contextual issues, if you like, that you need to bear in mind if you're thinking of running um, a team development program. Um, and thirdly, the, the last uh, uh, objective that we have is to take you through a, a team event outline. So I'm going to walk you through that. Um, that's broken itself into three separate components. There's an introduction, an explanation about risk type and dealing with personal reports uh, of the people who are participating in your, uh, in your group event. And then there's group work that uh, helps the, the group to discuss and to get into some sort of dialogue. Um, and then finally, there's consideration of a, the group report for that team and team development issues, exploring uh, how to perform better as a team. So first of all then, uh, risk type compass review. So this here is referring to uh, roots, it's the emphasis on the substance behind the risk type compass and its relationship to human nature. Um, human nature uh, and evolutionary survival depend on achieving a balance really between taking risks um, or not taking risks. If you either way, too many risks and uh, you may not last long or too few risks, similarly you may not last long. And because that applies to humans over the course of their evolution, it occurs the same for every other creature or animal and uh, the same for organizations. So that's the core of it, human nature and evolutionary survival. The biodiversity point really is pointing towards the variety that you will find in people's disposition towards risk. Biodiversity is something that assists evolutionary survival. If you have a species, for example, like leopards, who are, I understand, 99% similar in terms of their DNA, their chances of survival now are extremely slim. It just takes one adverse situation or circumstance or infection of some kind um, for that to wipe out the whole species because they're so similar. So di diversity is something that is strong and I think it's important to get that across in relation to a site compass because a lot of what we're talking about here is the diversity in uh, disposition to risk, in uh, the awareness of risk and how you manage it and how you deal with it. Um, and of course, it's important we get that balance right if we want a strong team. Um, the next two points are, uh, just cover the two axes to the risk type compass. They're both aspects of human nature. And the first of those, the axis which runs on the one end from being fearful and anxious to at the other end being very calm and imperturbable, almost impossible to unsettle. So we're all on that continuum somewhere. Some of us are fundamentally, by our nature, quite anxious. Some of us are, by our nature, calm and lacking in it. I guess we just have a strong nerve and we don't easily get unsettled or upset. Um, so that's one axis, one way in which you will vary. The second one is the need for certainty. 
versus the need for excitement. So some people don't want to do anything until they're quite sure everything is okay and is all right and is covered and is accounted for and they know exactly what they're doing. Um, whilst other people find that extremely boring, they would love to do uncertain things, they love change, they like excitement, um, and so we will lie somewhere on that axis as well. Now we're talking here, um, and, and if you've heard me talk about this before, you'll be aware of this point, we're talking here about your disposition towards risk. Of course, there's also other factors that influence your day-to-day -day behavior, um, which we would describe as risk attitude, but risk attitude is based on um, your propensity for risk and what is naturally you, and it's that which has the pervasive long-standing influence on your behavior. So uh, the risk type is at the roots of personality. It literally comes from personality. We, our starting point in developing it was the consensus that now exists on the structure of personality, and we simply extracted everything that had anything to do with risk, risk-taking, uh, response to risk, risk awareness, decision making and so on. And this is this was instrument, this assessment was the result. The second point then, how does it work? This is a reminder then for those who haven't seen this, it's a, it's a matter of being placed somewhere within that center shaded gray area um, and that will, the assessment will decide where in that circular space you you naturally reside, but what is typically typical of you. Um, so eight risk types. Then you can see labelled around the side: wary, prudent, deliberate, composed, adventurous at the bottom, and then carefree, spontaneous, intense at the left-hand side. If you're near the outside, if you're positioned near the rim, then that would suggest you're a very strong example of that particular type. And if you're placed near the centre, then as you move towards the centre, the strength of those characteristics get weaker and weaker and less and less distinctive until they kind of disappear in a fog in the middle. I mean, there's an area in the middle which we describe as typical, and that's where the people are who aren't really distinctive on either of those axes we discussed in, on the last slide, and so it's really difficult to really say very emphatically that they're one type or another. They may have some tendency one way or the other, but it's not enough uh, to, to, to characterize somebody in, in that particular way. Um, the other thing about the compass is that at the top, towards the top, towards the wary end, are the people who are most fearful of, of risk and the most anxious. So the most risk averse, if you look at it in a vertical sort of way, the ones near the top, are the most risk averse, the ones near the bottom are the ones who are most adventurous and risk taking. Um, it, it sort of breaks down into three uh, sectors really. There are the intense, wary, and prudent at the top are the most risk averse, the wary is the most of all. And at the bottom, the carefree, adventurous, and composed are the most risk taking, the adventurous, the most of all. And then across the middle, you've got spontaneous and typical and deliberate, and they are all near the mean in terms of their risk taking but they're very different in, in, in terms of what that disposition implies in terms of their behavior. Very, very contrasting, deliberate and spontaneous, but both are characterized as being average in terms of risk tolerance. And then around the outside, then just to reinforce that, towards the top, you've got people who are averse to risk and, and averse to ambiguity, really. Prudent people want everything labeled, want everything in its box, want certainty. And then around the bottom, the composed are the most resilient. They're the ones who we would describe as perhaps imperturbable. And the carefree are flexible, excitement-seeking, and so on. Okay, so why does it work? I think the answer, the one answer to that question is, is because it differenti differentiates individual differences. It's relevant to individuals. Very often in management discussions, it's, it's the employees versus the managers versus one category or another. It may be categories of the HR, it may be the department or the function that you work in and so on. Um, what is different in a way about risk type compass is it gets down to differences within the individual. It takes a, a person perspective and that's very strong for a number of points of view. Number one it's strong because the whole discussion about risk is very unmanageable. Risk applies as we're going to say discuss a little bit later on but just about to everything. 
There's nothing that hasn't can't have an, a, a risk associated with it. And so the dis discussion then is very easily derailed and confused um, for that reason. Whereas if you look at risk in relation to an individual and how they deal with it, you get a very coherent picture. It makes more sense of all that information, puts it all into place. Um, so that's, that would be the first thing. The second thing is that um, in any enterprise, people need to take risks. You don't succeed at anything unless you take the chance sometimes, you try something new, or you do something innovative. But obviously you have to also achieve a balance. So the fact that you can differentiate people is very helpful in any of these uh, situations described on the screen at the moment. It differentiates, we know, it differentiates very well between individuals. And if you are taking that, I hope that you'll concur with that. Certainly, uh, the, the vast, vast majority of people who take risk site compass uh, identify with it and understand why, how that would relate to them. Um, and so it makes sense in change management and stress, for example, because who gets stressed? I and mean, you can talk about stress as a function and how change management makes employees stressed, but it doesn't make all employees stressed. It makes some employees stressed and others love it. They can't wait for the next change in whatever the organization is doing. It's a relief to the monotony to them. So generalizing about stress without recognizing that people deal with it very differently isn't very helpful. Similarly with project management, you want in project management to understand what different contributions the team can make. And so individual differences are a very powerful aspect of how you organize people to get the best result with that particular group. In financial advising, you have to have, people have very different appetites for risk, and so they have different investment needs. So in financial advising, again, it's down to the individual differences. So risk management is about or can be about people differences. It cannot be. It can be all about the risk. It can be all about regulations and procedures and so on. But you're missing a big trick if you don't take account of the fact that those arrangements, those procedures, those regulations are going to be dealt with very differently by different risk types. So risk type finally is a personal issue. It's a personal issue to you and it's a personal issue to me. You need to understand what your propensity is and where, what that means in terms of how you relate to other people, how you deal with things, and why you don't see eye to eye with some other people who might do it in a different way. Um, so it's, for all of those sorts of reasons, we would say it works very well. Finally, point, final point here, again, one that you've probably seen if you've seen any of our publications, but it's just this issue about um, the way, the impact of personality anyway, and risk type, remember, is a feature. It's the main core, if you like. It's a very significant core out of personality domain. And so how does that affect behavior? Well, it doesn't affect it in a mechanical way, as I said earlier. It's not mechanistic. People who are by nature, for example, introvert, are pathetically always introvert all of the time. They are able to perform in all sorts of situations, and it's the same with extroverts. Extroverts aren't always bouncy and bumptious and uh, talking ten to the dozen. They know and can learn how to restrain themselves and how to uh, moderate those natural tendencies. So that's the same for all of us. We all moderate our natural tendencies, and we all have to moderate and deal with our risk type as well. So risk type is is, is um, indicated by the anchor, that's stable and it's hardwired, it's how you are. But your behavior can change because of nurture, because of your experiences, because of what you've learned, um, because of what your desires are, because of what was expected of you, and you will try to perhaps conform. So the boat then, over a period of time, you could work out where the anchor is. You wouldn't know immediately you saw the boat floating on the, in the harbor, where the anchor was, but as it moved with the tides, moved with the winds, you'd learn where the anchor was. And it's the same with people. We learn what people are like, not in the short term. We can all in the short term pretend. We can all present a particular face. Uh, that's why interviews are such a poor judge of character. Uh, in, in reality, you've got to wait probably for, well, think of yourself, but about you know, three or four months before people actually relax enough to reveal what they are really like once they get into a job. So we're talking about dispositions then, that's the point. Risk type is disposition. 
Okay, now some of those preliminary issues. This is saying, well, we're going to do a team event. What do we need to take into account uh, when we're approaching that task? Um, one of the issues is about the pervasiveness of risk. Again, it's a, it's a matter of not wanting to get hijacked by the whole discussion and definition of risk. That uh, can be a nightmare because, as I said before, it's so much of it and it applies to so many different things. Um, it's more, in fact, uh, than a subject. The, the risk isn't a subject. It's not like geography or history or mathematics with a ring fence around it. You know, maths has its risks. I suppose that's all probability theory, isn't it? Statistics. Um, history has its risks. Every subject. Geography has its risks. So the risk aspect applies uh, across the board. It's, uh, it's absolutely everywhere. Um, and so it's, it's more, if you like, a condition or a personal state, the state of being at risk, if you want. So that's the, the kind of perspective that we have on it. It's an aspect of anything and it's an aspect of everything. Um, and we are all risk managers from birth when we first, in, well, actually from conception, because when you first uh, start taking risks in life, all the way through to death, when I guess you can characterize as succumbing finally to the risks that, whatever they were, that caused your demise. Um, the ethical issues are important because when you assess somebody using a tool like the risk type compass, that information um, is personal information. It's really owned by the person who has been assessed and as a psychologist we conform to the BPS expectations that we will treat it with respect and we would only use it uh, beyond its original, original initial use with the informed consent of the individual. When this comes into a team building context though, um, it's a matter of setting things up in a way that allows people to contribute and doesn't necessarily presume that they will. Because it depends what kind of team you are and what, I guess and all sorts of different aspects of the team. Maybe it's age, it's profession, it's purpose and so on. But in general, that's the, the right approach to take. So you can deal with uh, team development on a purely um, confidential basis if you have to. It's never actually happened to me. I mean, always you find that people, when they realize there's no right and wrong in this type, then they're usually happy to contribute and to take part and to be quite open about what they feel about themselves. And this we have found time after time after time and over a long period of time. So you work for that sort of open participation, but you don't assume it. Uh, you be aware of the boundaries. You have the boundaries of what is personal and what is in now in the, in the group domain, if you like, in the course of that event. The other issue about groups is, of course, any group of people may or may not get on. And it's uh, quite natural for fault lines within teams to develop. Um, so subgroups, uh, coalitions and factions, we describe them as, or it's maybe just personal interest. People have similar likes and dislikes. Um, the, the thing about this is it doesn't matter. You don't have to like someone to be effective with them in a team. So the, the important thing is to remain task focused in your, in, in your initial attempts to bring a team together. Task focus is because the task is shared, you have a common interest in it, you're all collaborating to get the same result. You, that's the one thing you definitely do have in common while you're a member of that team. So focusing on that is a very good idea to begin with. Obviously, it's quite positive development if that group also turns into uh, something more than that in terms of relationships, but it's not, the, it's not essential that they should. Um, so the, what I would, what I'm raising, the reason I'm raising this point is because the last thing you want to do first day in the team is say, I know, let's all get to know each other, let's all go out and have a drink together, because you try to take on that sort of social dimension, you just drive people more into their own interests and likes and dislikes, and if they, even if they perform very courteously during that event, is not really going to help your cause. It's the task focus first, and secondly, the relationship focus. The next point is you're asking people to participate in something which may be quite unfamiliar to them. Um, not everybody will have experience of working in a group uh, event of this kind, where you're invited to be introspective, you're invited to reveal things about yourself. People usually go in or often go into group situations being very defensive and cautious. 
um, they don't they may they may go in um, to impress they may be competitive they may be self-conscious may be apprehensive and anxious and of course their risk type will have a uh, an influence on the way they approach that task and, and get involved in that in that event. Um, so the suggestion is here that you make a very progressive introduction to the process itself. That you take account of self awareness and individual differences, and you focus initially on things which are easy for people to deal with, which is basically people who are not not here, not me, no one in this room, not necessarily at work. Your reference points can be beyond that and very generalized people this or people that to begin with. But the hope is that you'll, uh, the discussion will increasingly turn towards people that others know, to maybe close friends and colleagues, finally to yourself um, and your ability to care, compare yourself, readiness to compare yourself with others. Again, that is the climate you need to establish for this type because it really is a situation where no one type is better or or, or, or not. You know, it's like a football team. In a football team, you need goalkeepers, you need strikers, and you need wingers, and you need backs, and you need midfield players, and so on. No one is better than the other. You can't, you can't succeed without having everybody doing their task very well. And any team, is, is to some degree, is, is in the same, same sort of situation. So whether you're a goalkeeper or uh, if you're risk averse, no problem. If you're risk-taking, uh, risk adventurous, excitable type, then fine, that's good too. So a team event walkthrough, now let's have a look. Um, we're going to look at here, the, what are you trying to do here with this team? It's important to share this with the team for them to understand what it is we're interested in doing with our group. So your understanding of risk type is important, so you need to understand your own profile. Um, they need to understand their own strengths and limitations. That's one thing we're trying to move towards in the course of the team event that you're running. Um, you want them to appreciate other people's contributions and, and how different other people can be. So you, you want them to achieve an understanding of that and an acceptance of other people's profiles so that, and a recognition that there's no bad or good, we're just all different in terms of our risk type. Um, we need then to understand the team, that's sort of the individual end. Now we need to understand the team and its risk appetite. Now, how, 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 what's the risk appetite of this team if you have this group uh, together? What are the dynamics between the people within the team? So we, what we are aspiring to do is to open up communication lines so that people talk constructively to one another. Uh, we want to reduce resistance and increase the motivation. Uh, and again, we want to enhance the working relationship, not the personal relationship, but the working relationship. We want to make it as effective as we possibly can. Um, so we want to also be aware, as a team, what are our strengths, what are our limitations, what are our strategies. So we're going into a game, whatever the sport, that's how you would approach it. Look, we're really bad at this aspect of it, so let's make sure that we play like this in order to minimize that problem. In the end, then, the, uh, the final point, really important point is, it's about getting people, individuals, to take personal responsibility for their own, own contribution to the team and therefore to the team's effectiveness. And that personal responsibility thing is key because in some ways it's only the individuals who know what the challenge is for them and their particular propensity for risk. Okay, so in the team workshop our objectives are going to be Personal responsibility, what can I do? That's what we want the, the people attending to, to accept. And secondly, the second objective is team responsibility, what can we as a team do? So what can you change? You can understand how risk type influences perception of risk, willingness to take risk, how it affects decision making. Um, you can know yourself better. You can understand your impact on other people and you can be aware of others and their risk profile and understand why others behave as they do. If you are, have a very different uh, risk type to another person in the team, you may be frustrated by the fact that every time you want to do this, they want to do that. And every time they want to do that, it's the very thing you would never do. So this is what we have to understand. I mean, this, that, that is potentially uh, a, a, a fracture point within the team, but it's also critically beneficial. Um, you need those different perspectives. But what can we do then? We can ensure that team, the procedures we adopt within the team 
and that's procedures in terms of decision making and discussion and reaching agreements and working together, the processes for working together, that they appreciate the benefits of risk type differences, that they are receptive to a lot of different views and that they seek those different contributions. Um, you can have a climate which encourages openness and transparency, so it's not blame oriented, it's not critical, it resists groupthink and it's aware of risk polarization. Risk polarization we've discussed probably before, you may have heard this, but the risk polarization issue, something they call in the literature risky shift. Um, when you have a team of people who are all risk takers, then they go off the scale in terms of the level of risks. They will outcompete each other, as it were, to take greater and greater risk. And the same happens at the other end. If you've got a group of people who are disproportionately risk averse, then they become very uh, wary and cautious and bogged down in procedures and regulations and so on. So at either end of the scale, you get this polarization of risk, which can be counterproductive in its own right. What, can, what we can't do, this, it's important to address this within teams, because you've got to get their um, expectations focused on what's realistic and what you want to achieve. Um, so being able to write off the things you can't do is pretty important. And here's some suggestions. You may have some others, but what you can't do is change who you work with in general. Uh, you're in the team and that's it. You can't change what's happened in the past. If you've got history with any of those members, if the team's got history, well, we can't change that now. So we have to get over all of that, get on, look to the future. Um, we can't make other people change. If somebody's attitude isn't the same as ours and we don't like it, you can't make them change. That's not your job anyway. Uh, it's your job is to make sure that you are doing your bit, not telling them how to do theirs. And your job is also to be who you are and to do that well, not to try to be what you're not, i.e. don't take responsibility for something in the team which relies on attention to detail if you are the carefree type. That would be disastrous. And don't take responsibility for having a creative answer or an open-ended answer to a particular problem if, in fact, uh, you are a prudent type because you're not going to be able to do the job. So it's all about getting people doing the things that they are best at to get a team that really works well together. So this is the, I suppose, overview. Teamwork we view as an individual skill. You have the individual is the only person who really understands their own assets and limitations. They know what they've got. And they know what the challenge is for them whenever any particular proposal or with any particular task. Um, they have responsibility and they're accountable for whatever they're uh, uh, given account, <laughs> made accountable for. And they're also accountable to the team and to the management of the team and the wider organization. So responsibility then, but without authority. When you look at it, teamwork is a shared responsibility. They... Uh, there are common interests, everybody it has the same task, the same uh, things to achieve, a shared task, and they need to collaborate to get, to get there. So this is what we're proposing you discuss with the group in, to, in, in order to get the debate going, to get people to understand what is the challenge of this workshop. Okay, then you might run an introduction to risk type, and here's some thoughts about that. Um, I said, you know, I think the, the danger here is getting over technical and over theoretical. What we want to know is I think we have to accept that the risk type compass is what we're using for this. We can have theoretical debates outside of this meeting as far as possible or outside your workshop as far as possible. Um, but you're wanting to get dialogue going. You're wanting to talk to people though. So it's about uh, something which is... Um, going to get, get people uh, being uh, contributing and con add, joining in the, the, the event in a very positive way. So one of the things that you might do is to ask them to list roles or tasks that they're familiar with where risk taking might be the key to high performance and then some other tasks where it's the reason for performance being inadequate or poor. Now, if you do that as a task, you break up in, do individually, say, well, you've got five minutes to write down as many things as you can think of about high performance and then many things as you think about poor performance, and then get them to feedback that back, um, write the, the, the points that are made up on the flip chart to display the variation and variety in it, and just to get people going. Um, and the other alternative, or as well, 
you might want to write down three things that you've done this morning that involve risk. That's quite interesting because most people stop and think, oh, well, hold on, I didn't know I had any risk this morning. Oh, yes, I did. I boiled a kettle of water and I nearly burned my hand because it's, the steam's very hot. Or I got on the bus and the bus stopped suddenly and, and so on. So everyday events. There isn't anything that hasn't potentially got some risk attached to it. Um, another idea which we found that is very uh, helpful and quite fun is to play a game in which you try to think of something that could never harm anyone. Get everyone to write something down. What is completely un unable or incapable of harming somebody? And the challenge then is for the rest of you to find out how it could. Because almost anything can. It gets a bit kind of amusing at times, this one. So I think the last time we did this event, someone came up with a petal and we had to sort of fall back on um, whether or not they, they might give them hay fever. But it, you know, everything in reality, almost everything can be uh, made to, to be a risk. And I think the, the, uh, the example I love, and I've used many times, is Roald Dahl's story about someone being killed with a frozen leg of lamb. It's not the most obvious weapon to kill people. So risk that comes then is a personality tool. We have to get that point across. Um, and it explores individual differences in, say, people's disposition, capacity to manage, decision-making, resilience, all of those things which you probably now know something about. Um, so this is really just telling them what it does, what, 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 what and that they need to know and they need to understand. And also, a key point, that it assigns everybody to one of eight risk types. So by this time, if they know they're going to get a report later on in the process, they'll probably be paying attention to this and be very interested in it. This is then reading the type of risk type compass, as you know. We've gone over this once to, earlier in the presentation, but it's continuous spectrum is an important point to make. It's not really uh, eight distinct types. Those positions on the compass are like the numbers on a clock face that tell you where up to. But as time is continuous, so is risk type, that, it, that you can be anywhere in that sort of continuous spectrum. Uh, adjacent types blend one into the other, and if you're near the edge, then you will have some of those characteristics. Um, and also, facing types are literally opposite in terms of their characteristics. And of course, then, um, the eight risk types. So this is just uh, the sort of one liner that we often use to introduce people to the idea of risk types. I think if you're running a team event, though, you should probably have these printed out as well so they can refer to them. Um, it's quite difficult to pay attention and uh, take on a lot of information over a short period of time, I find anyway, um, and, and uh, so you need something to, a bit of scaffolding, something to sort of prop you up here on those sorts of issues if your memory isn't fantastic. Um, so to have something like this printed out is quite a useful tool. Then activities again, I mean, this is all geared to get people to participate. That's what you want. So take 10 minutes to read through the risk type descriptions on the sheet perhaps and write down which risk type can you most identify with. That's kind of a personal one, so you might not want to do that first. You might prefer, can you give an example of someone you have worked with who exemplifies one of these risk types? And then some supplementary questions there. What did you find difficult about working with them? What were their strengths? Uh, where Were they aware of the impact their behavior had on other people? And of course, there are many alternatives to that. But that, the, the difference obviously there is you're focusing not on the individuals in the room. If the thing's going very well and everyone's obviously up for it, then then maybe the first is a, is a reasonable starting point. This is uh, something that you've seen mostly before, I think. It's uh, our four good friends, uh, Peter, Henry, Sarah, and Juliet. Uh, they're my polarized people. They're extreme, extreme risk types. They do actually really exist, but they're quite good to go through. I mean, this is part of the business of trying to help people to appreciate just how different people really are and to understand that by and large in social interaction, we minimize differences. We tend to want to be like the person we're talking to. We try to exaggerate what common ground we've got. Otherwise, you wouldn't have much to talk about, would you? So. Uh, in in day-to-day -day life, you don't always realize how extreme some people may be. Once you know about risk type, you'll be tuned into it much more so. But uh, there are people who will go through an entire two-day training course um, and be a very extreme personality type, and it won't show because they'll be very good at managing it. 
Um, so in our types, then very briefly, Peter is the one who's super calm in every situation, self-confident and composed all the time, irritatingly probably if you're in a bit of a crisis. Juliet's the uh, excitement-seeking, easily bored, impulsive and undisciplined. So this highly imaginative person can also be a great contributor, but also um, a bit difficult to get on with in other circumstances. Um, Henry is the person who's very detailed, conscious and systematic. So obsessively organizing, um, these people can become very controlling because they want you to be organized, they want you to be unambiguous, they want you to be uh, predictable, just like everything else in their lives. So they try to make you that. Um, Sarah, on the other hand, is moody, changeable, irritable, quite difficult, quite uh, high maintenance Sarah in some situations, but very passionate and very committed and very enthusiastic about the things that she's buying into. Problem is, she invests a whole lot of emotion in things. So when they go wrong, then she's very upset. So hence her emotional roller coaster. Okay, so the task that your team might want to do then is having been introduced to these characters, uh, to take 10 minutes, write down some ideas about how they might, might approach planning their holiday. You can think about that for a minute. But I mean, you can see that uh, I don't think Henry's ever going to get out the door. He's so busy trying to plan last-minute things and schedules and blah, 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 alternatives. Um, and uh, Sarah may be in a good mood, might not, and so on. So anyway, it's an interesting one for you to do. So, I mean, the importance of all this, of course, is that people are very varied, and within the general population, there are very even distribution of, of, of those eight risk types. This is just a... A fact we can say with great confidence from thousands of people who have completed the risk type compass, this seems to be how it goes. And of course, if you look on the right hand side there, they're not absolutely equal, but they're very close to. And as the numbers build, we'll see how it goes. We'll let you know. Um, but it's uh, therefore, you can fully expect if there's one in eight chance of a person being one or other of those risk types, then you can be 90% certain that, that you're going to have some of them in, in your. No, maybe not 90%. You can be very, very sure you're going to encounter these people within your risk, uh, risk development or team development exercise. And it's important for them to know they will encounter them across the team and in their lives too. Um, this is now the other index you get from the risk type compass. So this is just where everybody in the team falls along risk tolerance index. So the, the measure that you would have from the team report would rather than having a typically where is a wary person, where is a composed person or an adventurous person, they would be actually the people in the team would be somewhere along that scale. Um, and the average for the team is the red block and the black line is the estimate of the risk tolerance of that particular group. This particular example then, bit overall, a bit below average in risk tolerance. And you might want to introduce the report structure, telling people what they can expect in their report, go through the pages perhaps as a few slides of the presentation, and then you present the individual reports to people. So that gets you through um, to, to that level. And of course, at that point, people are going to probably want to stop and read their reports, find out about them, uh, see what it has to say. Um, and you won't get any sense out of people while they're doing that for a little while. They'll be completely engrossed by that. So sometimes good idea to do that just before a break, a coffee break, or even if you're breaking the event into two halves, then one might be the next morning, for example, then at the end of the first part, then give out the report. So it's a nice tidy place to make a break. Um, after that then, activities related to your own report, write down a list of three adjectives to describe that risk type, or find a real life incident that illustrates how you reflect your risk type profile. Again, uh, there, there are all sorts of different activities. We try lots of things. We try new things usually when we're running courses to see how they run. Um, it's, uh, it's just important to, to understand that you need to uh, give people something that, that is easy for them to contribute to. You don't want people sitting there thinking, oh, I don't want to look silly. I don't want to get the wrong answer. You know, make, it, make, make it quite straightforward and simple for them to do it and fun. So the group report then. Now, the, uh, the current group report, which is on, the, on our website, is being replaced. And uh, within a matter of weeks, hopefully, we will have the new group report. What we've done for this next section is to build it around that new report, but 
taking graphics, which are actually also in the existing report, but we're changing the format so that it would fit in better with a team development sort of process. So what we're trying to do here now is to emphasize the point that, right, we've got all the numbers, we know who's what risk type, we know what strength and risk type they are and so on. That's just the bones. We now need to add the flesh, and the flesh is to do with what other aspects are in, in, in the complex uh, nature of the human beings in this group are going to be significant, and how will the dynamics work out, and uh, to what extent will the normal risk contributions be distorted by perhaps experience, or age, or authority, or seniority in the group, or, or whatever. So. We've got the framework, now we've got to see how does that translate into human detail within our group. So first of activity then may be to start thinking about what are the behaviours that may be influenced by a person's risk type. So that would be uh, another of those open-ended activities and where you would collect the information um, uh, at the end of the event or after everybody's had their thoughts. Um, another possibility, divide into two groups. Uh, in addition to a person's risk type, what other personal attributes would influence their decision making? So that's helping to think, what, it, what does it mean, this fleshing out business? What other factors ought we to bear in mind in thinking how risk types going to work with our group? And then it's down to the back to the numbers. So the first graphic we have here is what we describe as a scatter plot. Here you can see where each of the individuals in the team are placed. Here, for reasons of anonymity, we might use letters rather than people's names um, on the overhead. But you can see immediately with this particular group, there are three risk types not represented at all. Um, and you can see how there are two others who are really neither one type or another. So it's got a, a neutral sort of approach from those two. And then you can see how the others are grouped. And you've got a distinct faction, potentially, who are prudent and deliberate, very similar to each other. So these, it's a, this is a, a subject for discussion. Uh, what are the similarities? What, you know, what have the people got in common? Where, where, where are the big differences in the group? What things are missing from this team profile? As a team, how are these similarities and, and differences actually demonstrated? Are we aware? Does it reflect what we know about ourselves? And then the second graphic is about the influence for each of the risk types. Um, and you can see in this illustration, the deliberate and the adventurous have a lot of influence. And again, there's three which have no influence whatsoever, not on the radar. Uh, so again, a number of questions. You know, it's all the time trying to get people to discuss and contribute participate in the process. So what are the tensions? What influence might this have on a group risk perception? How can team members work together to increase team effectiveness in that particular scenario? And then an another picture, the third, this is showing you what is, if you aggregate all of the data, this is, and it was one individual, this is where they would be. So this is what we refer to as the center of gravity for the group, and there are a series of questions about that. What important features are not captured by that particular perspective? I mean, you generally expect when you average things out that people will uh, cancel each other out. The extremists in one direction will be cancelled out by people in another direction. Will that happen with this team? This is the discussion and the debate. So it's just giving you, you know, in this picture, another uh, perspective, another way to get into the can of worms, to find out what are we like really and to what extent then does that represent what we are? And is that how we are, we are seen by uh, other people in the organization? And then this is the example I was talking about where everybody is actually uh, on, the, on the graphic. So um, this is the team of people you can see quite clustered around the mean really. No one really, really extreme on the, the uh, risk-taking uh, end of things. They're just in the high range and the low range, but not the very high or the very low. So, points about that you would need to discuss, obviously. What are the implications of this overall average? What implications might there be if the team were viewed in this way within the wider organization? Are there any benefits um, for this particular team? Are there any limitations or disadvantages about this particular set of uh, risk tolerance index scores? This is uh, some, a way of just showing how different professions differ 
in the kinds of individuals get attracted to them and who remain working in those sorts of professions. So you can see many more carefree recruiters than there are carefree auditors. There are any carefree auditors in that graphic. Um, and similarly with the IT professionals, they are inclined to be more uh, adventurous types within, within that group. Um, so that's looking at role differentiation, if you like. So, and it's how uh, different or similar is your team profile? Uh, is your team profiles? <laughs> is your team profile in comparison to elsewhere within the organisation? How does risk type affect relations and communication with colleagues in other areas? So, thinking about how do how are you perceived as a group? We know that there's a reluctance sometimes to communicate with people who seem very, very different. People who are more extrovert and boisterous and open. Uh, I find people who are more reserved and reticent, uh, less approachable, and so on. So knowing where, how you stand and what sort of vibe you're giving out off within the organisation is important in considering how you will relate to the rest of the organisation. So then, team objectives. Now, I mean that 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 ends. Of uh, the the basic uh, as parts of the the walkthrough and the and the event and the final thing though is to set some team objectives and to remind people what it was you set out to do and that's just a repeat of the slide that you saw earlier. Uh, we need to review the workshop's aims and establish whether or not we uh, never really make progress on those, um, and then remind people that. We're, what we are all about here in this uh, event is establishing personal responsibility. What can I do? What can you individually all do to make this team work better? What's your contribution going to be? Um, and secondly, team responsibility. What can we all together, uh, how can we improve our performance through those aggregation of what individuals can do? So team goal setting, what should you keep doing as an individual, um, what should you do more of, and what should you stop doing, these are very straightforward questions that you need to ask yourself, and then the same for the team. <coughs> and another activity group discussion then, about reviewing the process, consolidating the various points, prior you want some objectives first, we're going to brainstorm and say we could do this, we could do that, get this stuff out onto the flip chart. And then that's stage one, generate some ideas, and then secondly, have them viewed and have people rate them in terms of what they think is most important, almost vote for them, identify some smart goals that are going to maximize this team's performance. And then arrange for a follow-up meeting because, you know, have, see how things are going, have, keep you on track, to have some point in the future when you're going to take account of all of this work that you've been putting in in this team session. So and finally, this is a typical framework that you might use to summarize those concerns and your priorities and your smart solutions um, to the event. So you end up with something very tangible, something very specific, hopefully, and you end up too with a, a date when you're going to gather together and you're going to see how we're doing and maybe revise them or give yourself a big slap on the back because you're doing so well. So I'll pass you over to Grace now, and thank you very much for your attention. I went on a bit long there, uh, sorry about that, but um, very nice of you to stay and listen to all that, and, all that, and uh, we would love to uh, contact, uh, contact you. Do you have any questions? Over, over to Grace. Hello, hi, and good afternoon to everybody. Just to let you know, I'll be sending through the slides and the recording of the uh, presentation. Um, I don't think anybody has any questions, but obviously please, please do get in touch. You have my details, if it is that you do. Um, just to, to reiterate, I think from Jeff, there's really kind of stages of support that we can offer you with regards to this. So obviously our qualification workshops themselves gets you trained up to be able to um, utilize the tool, um, both obviously individually or via Teams. Um, but we can also support you so we can obviously go in and um, to some of these meetings and support you within the team um, itself and uh, with the workshop. Um, uh, or also we can support you in providing uh, presentation slides as well. So, so again, we have um, different levels of support. So please do get in touch and thank you again for your time.
um, this afternoon. Um, all the best and thank you.